then about them. First speaker is Gaurav Rastogi, who is an interfaith Hindu speaker, and he writes and talks about Hindu scriptures, bringing the ancient wisdom into practical language that can be applied to anyone interested in living deeply. So, Gaurav, you're on. Namaskar. Thank you, Ruth. And um, hello to everyone, each one of my friends here. So good to see everyone. Are you able to hear me? Affirmative. Thank you. Um, I wanted to begin with a prayer for this season. Uh, it's that time of the year. Um, it's November and each uh, day is, of course, now shorter and each night is longer. And as the shadows extend, we reach for the light that guides us. This weekend is the first moonless uh, night, night of the season, this Saturday. And we celebrate in the Hindu tradition uh, Diwali, which is a celebration uh, uh, of the light within, as well as the, it's the festival of lights. We celebrate by lighting uh, um, candles, but they're, they're made, they're, well, they're, all, they're, they're not wax candles, but here we use wax candles, but essentially lay out lights in a in a sequence and uh, and just like a chain around the house and uh, celebrate the darkest night of the year with lights uh, we call it diwali and it's a time for rebirth and it is also a time for to think about the meaning of material life itself and so i wanted to chant for you this famous upanishad it's a verse from hindu scripture uh, it's one of the oldest scriptures. This is the Brihad Aranaka Upanishad, which is the great wilderness lectures. And I'm going to chant it for you. So um, it does, it's, uh, I'll, I'll also describe the meaning later so you're able to follow along. For now, just sit comfortably in any posture. You can sit as you're sitting, but sit with your back straight, your back, neck and head in a straight line. Close your eyes gently and relax the expression on the face. Relax your shoulders. Relax your belly. Now bring all your attention into the belly. As you inhale, let the belly expand. As you exhale, let go. Inhaling into the belly, and as you exhale, let go of all your thoughts, all preoccupations, any concerns that you walked in with. Just let everything go. Breathing into the belly, let the belly expand. Breathing out, simply let go. I'm going to chant Om once, then I'll chant the, the uh, verse, then I'll describe the meaning to you. You can keep your eyes closed. Oh. Asatoma Satgamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityorma Amritam Gamaya Om Shanti 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 In English, this is translated as From untruth lead us to truth From darkness lead us to light From death lead us to immortality Om Peace, Peace, Peace and welcome to today's conversation. Uh, the topic today is really interesting. I had a lot of uh, fun researching it and just collating my thoughts because uh, I was looking for something that makes it a compelling story and something that is uh, enjoyable to hear. And uh, what's enjoyable if there's no di disagreements or differences of opinion? The topic today is how does your congregation help to bridge the different political or social justice views within it? 
and uh, and so using the uh, the idea of social justice i went back to read up on what social justice issues we really do care about these days and four stood out as things that we there, there's a lot of conversation within the community uh, the wider community here in the us about it and um, why not think about how the hindus are thinking about it and what if any are the differences of opinion within the broader hindu community on these issues so the four issues that the social justice issues that i'm going to talk about are climate justice which is of course yeah, includes um um you know yeah, you know uh, being aware of the environment uh, ecological uh, um uh, uh, action as well as the fact that third world countries and poorer people will be more directly impacted by the climate change and so climate justice is really about um balancing that so climate justice is a hot issue uh, pun unintended it just came to me i apologize in advance the second is uh, transgender and lgbtq plus issues which is dealing with uh, you know issues of homosexuality as well as transgenders the third is refugees which is an issue of, of tremendous concern of course uh, and and the fourth is a social justice and specific to hinduism of course uh, i would be remiss if i don't talk about the caste system because everyone wants to hear that anyway so we'll cover that uh, let's begin with climate justice and i notice uh, there's a salman khan on this call which is fantastic sir i'm not referring to you in this story i'll tell you a story so <laughs> 20 years ago um this uh, famous movie star uh, Salman Khan not the gentleman on this call by the way uh, so Salman Khan is one of the three or four big khans that are famous actors in in, in India their movies come out they sell they sell out they it's the equivalent of launching their your movie on thanksgiving or christmas the movies sell out super uh, famous movie star so he's out in the indian deserts which is also in india on the west side of india and um, he goes out hunting hunting because it's apparently what one does he goes out hunting um, deer locally and as he's out hunting deer uh, day 1 day 2 day 3 day 3 he uh, he 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 hits a, a deer which isn't an ordinary deer this is a black buck and it's an indian antelope very beautiful looking uh, creature it's on the endangered species uh, list because they've been hunted out of extinction it's uh, you know unique to india but uh, in texas you might find a few black bucks as well they're beautiful looking creatures so anyway salman khan uh, allegedly is out in a jeep uh, and he shoots a black buck but next thing you know three men on a motorcycle come by and they gave chase and they they try to catch them they don't they don't catch up eventually they take the number of the the jeep and they register a police case and uh, what's interesting about the three men on the bike was they were not just ordinary regular villagers they were regular villagers but there was nothing ordinary about them the interesting thing about them was um they they were part of a hindu sect uh, called the bishnois Bishnois literally means the 29ers think of it as 29 and this sect has 29 rules that their founder gave them about 500 years ago and they're up all about eco conservation because they're in a desert eco conservation is a big thing and the black buck is extremely dear to this community so dear that they raise black buck children just like their own children if you look at you know look up the, on the internet you see women that are feeding child on one side black buck on the other side both uh, uh, sucking at the teat so they they're really fond of the black bucks they treat them as divinity and for them any any tree being cut or any black buck being being uh, uh, injured is um, is 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 terrible and so these poor villagers against the might of india's you know branding movie star um is a story that a movie should be made about but wouldn't be these guys then register a case and as you'd expect money wins even in india so so they lose the case they fight at the higher court and higher court 20 years elapse and they go all the way eventually the high court says look eh, there's no proof that the bullet that killed the black buck came from this guy's gun it sounds like a cop out 
but the point was that they pursued the case and finally i think he has a you know he has a, 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 a jail term waiting for him at some point in the future the point is there is a sect of hinduism that actually is um is um, is, a, is a very strong eco conservationist but they're not alone um, there's another community in the northern parts of india where if you've heard the term tree hugger uh, the term tree hugger originally comes from these people where uh, the mountains were being eroded the forests were being cut and a company that makes tennis rackets in the 1970s for for sale here uh, had the te- had a contract to cut 300 trees and these uh, the women in this community decided we're not having any of this so they tie themselves to the trees so it's called chipko andolan and there are these very moving pictures of poor village women uh, who are, who are essentially tied to the tree because they're not going to let the trees get cut the trees did not get cut the movement and the trees both survived and ecofeminism is a big deal uh, in that but neither of these are actually unique to you you know some quirky sects of poor hindu people um, at all hindus in general tend to be uh, eco conservationist uh, when we do our prayers we um, we tend to uh, um, pray to all the five elements and in that sense uh, there's a very active interest in eco conservation and so within the hindu community on the social justice issues there's really not much uh, range of differences of opinion where one sect says you know drill baby drill and the other sect says no 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 cutting trees generally speaking hindus are tend to be um, on the uh, progressive end of the eco conservation side uh, when it comes to protecting the environment uh, so that's one story which i thought was interesting uh, let's talk about um, um uh, homosexuality so it turns out uh, india inherit india and a lot of uh, british colonies inherited british common law and british law in general so if you look up section 377 it's common to all these countries where all their civic laws have a section 377 which in the 1800s victorian morality of course they outlawed homosexuality and uh, and the same victorian morality is is all over and in 2018 uh, the courts finally struck down this as being illegal and because it's of course illogical so um, the decriminalization of homosexual relations is um, is a very t- touchy subject and i remember and by the way everything that you do with the hindus thanks to the overwhelming impact of bollywood uh, the coping mechanism for everything in india is that you make a movie about it so there used to be movies poking fun at um, homosexuality in a light these are rom-coms or bro-coms in the sense that it's just the nudge nudge wink 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 kind of thing so when this outlawing when the 377 section 377 was cancelled the way the hindu uh, community reacted was a lot of silence you know the religious community wasn't out putting out edicts saying no no this is ridiculous it's a crime against uh, god over there's none of that system in the hindu tradition uh, there's been a lot of acceptance and of course as you'd expect a coping mechanism is now there are other comedy movies made about homosexuality but in a different way not the nudge nudge wink wink of 20 years ago uh, there is some controversy within the hindu tradition quasi controversy on whether the marriage itself uh, is something that um, that should be done in a religious framework or a civil framework and and some people say that there's no need for a religious framework for marriage because that's to have children uh, you should have a, a marriage for civil uh, you know for property rights and insurance purposes and so on that's all legit but on the uh, the uh, religious side is probably not required because you're not going to have kids from that union you can of course adopt so within the hindu tradition on homosexuality there has been broader acceptance on lgbtq plus that's quite interesting because hinduism in general has been non non binary uh, from the inception so we we do recognize a third gender uh, we've always recognized a third gender and and what's happened now is as we are letting go of the british sort of victorian era rules and and laws 
Uh, there's a broader acceptance of third gender people within the Hindu community. Um, they, uh, in fact, recently, the uh, one of the states in India uh, launched a, a metro station, which is now called Rainbow Rainbow Station, and it's of course it's celebrating uh, the third gender. And there's a whole university that has been created just for um, people that are of the third gender, uh, because previously they were not able to get jobs or they were not able to get uh, education and employment. So in general, there's acceptance of homosexuality as well as um, LGBTQ plus uh, issues. There's of course cultural pushback, as you can well imagine that culturally it's not accepted, but younger, more modern people are accepting of it. And it's all, uh, all um, um, there's no religious uh, sort of problem with it in, in that sense. So let's come to the next issue, which is the issue of refugees, which isn't a modern issue by any means. And uh, Hindus in general have been accepting of other traditions. So Hindus, uh, the broader region of India has been accepting uh, persecuted people for you know, thousands of years. So there have been, uh, there are Jewish people from 2,500 years ago, uh, all over India. There are very interestingly in the Northeast part, like super remote part of India in the, in the mountains, there's a community that realized only lately, about 70 years ago, that their tradition was oddly Jewish. And then they, they checked with people in Israel and they found out that, yeah, well, you check out and you're probably one of the lost tribes uh, uh, of, of uh, you know, Jewish people. And so they were inducted and some people have moved to Israel. Many, of course, live in India. So Jewish people have been in India for about 2,500 years. Uh, out of Iran, um, the Zoroastrian people moved about six to 700 years and were given uh, you know, land and, and uh, respect and of course continue to thrive. Very active community, uh, small but very active community. Um, uh, uh, St. Thomas, of course, the Doughton Thomas, uh, St. Thomas is quite interesting. Uh, the early Christians in India trace back to St. Thomas and his ministry. So they're Syrian Christians and they've been around for 2000 years as well. So in general, there's a broad acceptance of refugees in the Indian tradition. Uh, more recently, India um, uh, uh, created a law to, to fast track religious per, religiously persecuted minorities from neighboring countries. That way uh, they have an access to, for example, say example, Sikh people from Afghanistan who were flee, you know, the remaining Sikh people, they just moved to India and they were given um, access. There is a, some degree of controversy with uh, previously Bangladeshi refugees, which uh, don't come anymore because Bangladesh is actually doing really well economically. Uh, and now with Rohingya, refugees which are going to all countries including India around because of the troubles in, in Burma. There is some degree of economic pushback but it's the you know it's it's everywhere. Now let's talk about the big elephant in the room uh, which is the last issue I'm going to talk about which is the caste system. Now the, the caste system the word caste itself of course is Portuguese uh, casta from, from purity and the European people uh, had strange purity uh, laws. They had very class-based system. The 1% would only marry from within each other and everybody else was either a serf or a landowner or whatever. So when they came to India, the same genius minds that came to, to America and called the Native Americans as Indians, the same geniuses came, went to India and said, okay, we have to figure out a way to make sense of these people. And they reinvented a, a new system and gave it, called it caste system. Now, don't get me wrong. India is a really old society and the Hindus in general, are like every other community, are very class conscious. Add to it the occupational uh, 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 tradition, which is within the community. Uh, for example, weavers, uh, the sons of weavers are weavers. The sons of archers are archers. The sons of smiths are smiths. The sons of rights are rights. These are English last names, but you get the idea. Occupational communities tended to pass their occupation down. And if your community is lower in the social pecking order, then there's a lot of social order issues that, that come out of that. And so the British invented a caste system out of this occupational community uh, thing. Over the last, uh, I guess, few decades, Hindus have been trying to get rid of it. 
caste system exists not merely in the hindu tradition all other communities in india you know christians have caste in india uh, islamic muslim people have caste in india as well there's a lot of, because again racism and classism is 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 prevalent everywhere it's not a core part of the hindu tradition and what the hindus have been trying to do is get rid of it uh, in many different ways one interesting way is um, is reservation so uh, a lot of jobs uh, education as well as jobs 50 to 70% of positions are reserved for people from uh, certain communities and and uh, and that's one way the other is because of these incentives to to people from uh, downtrodden communities the pressure is now reverse and now people that were previously classified as higher end communities are now trying to uh, politically sort of come around and be assigned a lower denomination so that they're able to get those reservations for education as well as jobs so it's an interesting dynamic that's going on within the hindu tradition for example here you know at the levamore temple or any other temple we don't uh, we don't know i mean everyone's welcome they don't need to be hindu to to come in in general when we're here we have no idea what anyone's caste is no one's ever asked me i've never asked anyone and in here it's not as if we are interested in retaining those distinctions that in classes that exist uh, so that's really the only controversial part that i could find within the hindu tradition so four issues that i've talked about climate justice i've told you the story of uh, eco conservation um, homosexuality i've talked to you about section 377 and the transgenders refugees I've talked about the sort of broad tradition of refugees and the caste system of course I've covered a little bit about so that's the range of social justice issues and the the dis- differences of opinion within the hindu tradition that exist uh, by the way on the caste system one of the big things that you might have heard of is that there's a priestly class and there's a you know people that are untouchables over the last couple of decades there's been a lot of um, investment by hindu uh, sort of reformist and just ref- hindu organizations uh, over the last i think 5 years 5000 people from untouchable communities we don't use that word untouchability is a crime in india um, they so 5000 people have been trained to be priests and uh, they can now serve in temples and they're certified and you know and so on so there's that degree of reformation that's going on and that has broad acceptance as well so that was the talk that's the broad range of hindu perspectives on social justice issues i'd be happy to take any more questions in the couple of minutes we have remaining ruth i turn it back to you you're on mute of course yeah and uh, am i not on mute now yes okay good so um questions for garab just raise your hand on the um chat and we'll call on you so we have to get back to the all the people right yeah <laughs> oh okay and if you don't know how to raise your hand you can just unmute and start talking did you hear that <laughs> yeah we got that yeah. Rob, I have a question. Yes, sir, ma'am. Hi. How are you, sir? Very well, thank you. You mentioned about uh, an effort to uh or yeah, efforts to kind of uh end or effort, yeah, efforts to end the caste system. Uh, what does an end goal look like in that? Right? What what so so it's one as it right so, so we talk about a telios, right? So the end what would that what would that look like? What would it bring? India too as a as a country and you mentioned that from the portuguese uh, roots is is it is it solely from that or is there an aspect i think you did say that there is also a, a, a kind of a class system that exists inside of uh, you know the higher hierarchical system that exists inside of, of hinduism as well too. sure yeah yeah uh, so uh, the uh, what's happening now is uh, uh, 
Uh, so there's a lot of, of course, port bank politics that India is a thriving democracy. And the interesting thing there is there's been a lot of vote banking where you, you sort of you make a little Venn diagram, then you make a smaller circle and you own that circle that somebody else makes a smaller, yet smaller circle inside. So there's a lot of social justice issues that uh, masquerade or that are over, overwhelmed by, by uh, these vote bank politics. And the big drive there is you can't really govern by vote banking. Uh, smaller bits. So you're going to have to look for issues that everyone's interested in. So politically, what I see happening is there's been a drive to create broader platforms around the economy, for example. So India's made, what, 120 million, 110 million toilets uh, because people didn't have toilets, for example. Uh, and so just bread and butter issues so that people are more interested in those instead of, you know, who their community is and what their neighbor is because those issues are not germane to a modern society. And that's what's going on on that front. The emphasis on education has definitely been a, a big deal where if you look at the IT people that come from India um, off late, right? I mean, I came as part of that boom, so I can speak for uh, that. Uh, no one really cares what community you're from. You've done your engineering, you're in IT, go get your thing. But what happens with that is each one person that's in the IT business, for example, feeds 10 other people in the community because the whole community gains out of that. And that changes the dynamic. So there's a lot more interest in engineering, for example, as a career option, because you can go past, you can leapfrog you know, hundreds of years of subjugation by just you know, four years of engineering. And that's been a big change. And now, of course, other occupations as well. So I think broadly the end goal is, is really look, uh, is to get to a point where people are focused on economic development and cultural and spiritual development instead of uh, being in a sort of regressive medieval mindset because that's not helping anyone in that sense. Smaller divisions are not going to help uh, all of us pull together. Yes, Ruth. Um, I'm interested in uh, your education system. Is uh, education free for everybody or do people uh, who are rich get better education than people who are middle class or poor? How does it work? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I have to tell you the education system in India is, is terrible. <laughs> I say, say that with no sense of irony because I'm here as a result of that, but I'm, I'm an exception to that. Uh, the education system in India was designed by the British to create civil servants, so clerks, people who could write and scribe, uh, not thinking, not, not liberal arts, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, civic leaders kind of thing. So it's a, it's a system that's designed for rote learning, repetition, and mastery of memorization of facts rather than an ability to, 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 to think and reason and argue. Uh, and that's been a problem. That's one problem. Now your question is, do rich people go to better schools? Yeah, I went to a Christian school uh, because of course those are private schools and I, I have I've had a Christian education all through my, my, my schooling as a result of that. Um, so yeah, uh, rich people do go to private schools. Private schools are, of course, they charge more and they're better. Uh, public schools are getting better. So there's a sort of left-leaning socialist type government in Delhi, which is the city I grew up in. And they're doing a lot of investment into improving the quality of public schooling, which uh, I don't but I should say public schools, when they say public school in India, it, those are private schools. Government schools are public schools, but never mind. So, so public schooling is generally low quality, but they're trying to improve it. Paucity of teachers is a problem huge country, you can't, and lots of young people, you don't have enough good quality teachers because everyone's a product of the same rote learning system that came by. Higher education, however, is actually good in India. And, I, and it's super cheap. I did my entire engineering in the equivalent of, let me see, $70 over four years is probably all I paid. And uh, it's highly subsidized. Um, you could pay for private, but public education is very cheap. I did my MBA at India's number one program for maybe a thousand dollars of modern money. It wasn't expensive. 
and uh, and that's the relic of the socialist uh, sort of economy that india had been for the longest time now there are private uh, education institutions and a, a lot of kids come here to the us for their masters because they really want to get a better longer sort of deeper education the poor people in general ruth your question is poor people do not have access to high quality education they have access to government education which is free but um, it's it's not it's not really a uh, great quality okay so uh rashma has connected up correctly she has a yes. hand up okay so you're going to go and then john and one um hello thank you so much for your the information um sorry i'm trying to see who's talking uh, so i can actually look at your face sorry Hold on, let me let me uh, let me see if I can un. Uh, hold on, hold on. Let me just see if I can do that. Oh, uh, Reshma, yes. Hey, Reshma. Hi. Yes, I see you. Hey, <laughs> yeah, uh, I I was so I I'm a Muslim from India. I didn't realize we had a caste system. So we I thought that was one of the you know the, um, I think it what may may have happened is that we the Muslims that converted. I think it was a male absorbed it, but theoretically, at least, Islam doesn't recognize the caste system. Yeah, yeah, I agree. That's the theory, but I think it's a cultural system more than it is anything. If you go to matrimony sites, even in Pakistan, which is you know an Islamic state, well, you're going to yeah. see a lot of that. I think it's just yeah. inherited. Yeah, it's a really racism because usually when you go to matrimony sites, it's usually are you fair and slim. And totally. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and for example, if you speak English in India with a particular accent, then you're higher order human than someone who speaks with an accent because then you're, you know, a lesser species of humanity, I guess. So there's a lot of, you know, classism that goes on in India. Every community has that. Yeah. There I am. Okay, I'm back. I have done the mute. Um, so my question is, um, all this is wonderful, and thank you very much for all this information. Um, my question is more on a microcosm level, is the, within my own congregation, we have quite, I'm an Episcopalian, a Christian. Um, we have quite some very big differences politically um, and maybe even faith-wise. Um, so how do, in, in your congregation, how do you deal with those huge differences between yeah. people? And yeah, that's an interesting question because it turns out, he, he, so Hindus in general are not congregational, I should, I hasten to add. So it's not that the, this temple in, in Livermore is, is we can go to any temple we go to all the temples so i speak for the broader american hindu uh, uh, population here um, politically it's been quite interesting where hindus in general uh, uh, skew highly democrat uh, democratic and uh, till a few years ago it was odd you'd see a few people out on the east coast that skew republican and uh, and and people didn't know what to deal with that uh, what's happened off late is that the, the the sort of locus is shifting a little. Hindus are skewing somewhat, uh, uh, still overwhelmingly blue, but more people are, are leaning Republican depending on who they are and what they are. A lot of that is just what media they're watching, what kind of people they're following or what issues they care for. So if you see... Um, if you see the, the Trump government, a lot of uh, his, you know, his the people that worked for him were Indian people, uh, and uh, and so you see that, and you see a lot of uh, sort of swing. How Hindus are dealing with this red versus blue polarization is uh, we don't talk about it at the temple because we're not congregational. We don't have to see each other's face ever. We don't have to, you know, we don't go to the temple on Sundays or Tuesdays and say you you sir are doing this or that. We just don't. So because we don't have to see each other, there's really not that much argumentation. You can do your own thing and uh, run your own uh, platform, and it doesn't invite as much uh, trouble. You can meet each other for festivals, and it, it, there's not much issues there. Debates don't happen within the community, which is part of the challenge where of organizing Hindu voters, because how do you tell them where to vote? They're going to vote whichever the way they individually feel. Um, and that's just how this community is organized. 
but politically uh, overwhelmingly democrat now beginning to shift a little bit uh, to the if you look at political uh, leanings the hindus tended to be the most blue of all communities in the us it's outright like majority blue but that is shifting a little as you'll see also with the latinos that are shifting a little towards republican a certain type of latinos for example so that's the interesting shift but it hasn't created a schism in the community if that's your question it's not as if people are screaming at each other and uh, and are vilifying each other that hasn't happened because we don't see each other at the temple as okay, much so we have time for one more question and that's uh fancy I don't know if I for a while. Oh, Santi. Hey, Santi. Hi, good evening. Yeah, I'm in India now, so it's 6, 7 o'clock in the morning. So I just wanted to share along with Gaurav's thought, I mean, his uh, speech on education. So the one huge difference I see in uh, education in India and U.S. is there is not much of caste difference from public to private schools. Uh, in fact, and also uh, my medical education, he finished his engineering in, uh, or he finished engineering in $70. My whole uh, medical education finished in $200 yes. versus $350,000 in US, right? So we came to like, no, yeah, to, Improve my skills, I came abroad, but I'm back to India to serve my community also here. So I think education is a huge cost in US, but in India also compared to the time I did my uh, undergrad and postgrad medicine, now it's become a uh, little more uh, expensive. But as such, education is um, not that expensive compared to uh, Western countries even in private schools and i studied in private schools mostly but uh, just on merit basis my father gets admission i don't pay extra fees yeah, so that's my uh, input yeah thank you uh, thank you so i i'm going to uh end garage time and thank you uh, and, and I, I want to say thank you very much and well, I'm going to clap. Thank you, Karan. Thank you very much. And I want to go on to our second speaker, um, who is uh, Dawood Yassin. And I have a little information about him. He spent five summers teaching Arabic language at the Zaituna Summer Arabic Intensive. Dawood has worked with colleagues to establish learning outside of the classroom program at Saituna College, which includes service learning trips and a revival of traditional athletics found in swimming, archery, and horseback riding. That sounds like a lot of fun. Okay, Dawood, you're on. Thank you, Ruth. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I begin with the name of uh, Almighty God, the compassionate, the